greatly appreciate uh, our time and effort in doing this. So without further ado, Dr. Bhatia, please uh, share your uh, screen and uh, start your uh, presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for attending the presentation, uh, attending the webinar. So good morning, everyone, and good afternoon or good evening all over the world. And first, uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Reddy, for not only inviting me, but organizing this extraordinary seminar civics. Uh, so today, I think I am going to talk about dewatering contaminated slurries. And let me make a little correction. Not all the slurries are contaminated. And uh, what I'm going to emphasize is what do we learn from case histories? Uh, can, you, can you put it in the presentation mode, Shama? Yeah, I'm going to do that. Uh, okay. Now, um, my presentation is, I think, around 40 or 50 minutes. Sometimes we don't time it very well. And I will be very, very happy to answer any questions. I have my email right here. So if I am unable to answer your question, in a given time, please contact me. I will be delighted to answer any questions. Okay, And this is particularly from all the graduate students from all over the world. So I show you here on two uh, photos of two uh, areas of project. One is a river, other is a lake. Uh, on the left-hand side is a river. Uh, this is in New Jersey. And this river, they had to remove. Let me see if I can get a pointer, right? Okay, laser pointer. So this river, they had to remove 3.5 million cubic yards of contaminated sediment over six years. And the project, total project would cost around $1.36 billion. The right-hand side, this image is a lake. And this is a lake in Syracuse where I live for last 35 years. And in 19, um, early 1994, EPA designated that as a contaminated site and a super fund. And this was known as one of the most contaminated lake in US. Uh, we are not very proud of it, but that's the reality. And in that part of the cleanup of the project uh, required 2.2 million cubic yards of sediments which had to be dredged from this lake. Okay. Now, these are not the two only river and lake which have this problem. There are thousands of lakes and river all over the world. Some are this large, some are small, some are just little pond, where sediments which have been deposited over the time or contaminants which have been dumped over the time have really resulted in these lakes contaminated lakes. So let's talk about today's topic is that one of the ways we clean up these water bodies are is to remove these sediments. And removal is generally done by dredging. But when we dredge these sediments, in addition to the sediments, we bring a lot of water. So the quality or quantity of these slurries are very large. And then we need to store them or treat them and one of the important part of doing that is to really dewater them, remove extra water. So I'm going to talk about today, what are dredge sediment management techniques? I'm going to discuss with you, what are geotextile tubes? And what are the design and performance requirements for these tubes? What kind of tests one does in lab and field? Many of these tests we have done at Syracuse University. And then I'm going to talk about case histories, three case histories, and what lessons did we learn from these case histories. So let's start with dredge sediment management techniques. And there are actually four columns here. So let's start with sedimentation pond. This is one of the oldest method of really dewatering sediments, where these ponds are basically a clay not clay lined, but just low permeability, shallow ponds where these sediments or slurries are deposited. And with natural sedimentation, particles will settle. Extra water, if it's clean, can be removed. Uh, so this was a very common technique. But the big problem with that 
first sedimentation can be very slow and because of the particles are very small and it consume very large area. And if sediments are contaminated, then it's not safe and nobody wants these kind of ponds in their neighborhood. Next two are belt press and centrifuge. These are mechanical ways to dewater sediments or slurries. These are used commonly for small projects, uh, more like factory kind of operation. Uh, paper industry still uses these um, methods and they required large capital cost and constant maintenance and energy. So they are not inexpensive. The fourth column is a geotextile tube. I'm going to move the people here. And what you see here in this image is a big tube. This is made of a synthetic material, geotextile, which is permeable. And they come in different sizes. You can make a small tube. You can make a very long tube. You can make a different diameter tube. And so you can change the configuration. And they can dewater very large amount of sediments. And then once the tubes are filled with sediments, then we can use some tubes to build some infrastructure. And so I think this is the very common method of now uh, dewatering sediments. So let's talk about a little bit more about what is geotextile tube. And I saw a one hand raised, and I am going to wait to answer your questions um, after this my presentation. Uh, so please send your questions in the chat room. So geotextile tube, as I mentioned, they are made of geotextile. They can be very long, as long as 100 meter. They can be of different diameter. And slurries are filled and they are sewn in a form of the tube. And slurries are pumped in the tube from the pore, which are spaced at a certain distance. When slurries are pumped in, there is some pressure. And there will be a lot of concrete complex process, which I'll explain to you, <coughs> undergoes when slurries are pumped. As the slurries are pumped, before you pump it, the tube may be a spherical shape, but as the water comes out from pores of the geotextile, sediment will retain, of course, with some water, uh, but the tube changes to the shape of ellipsoid. When we pump the slurries in the tube and sediments are contained, we need to be careful about, or at least be aware of what kind of tensile stresses will develop in the tube itself, both uh, longitudinal and transverse, not in the tube itself, but at the port. So we need for that high tensile strength geotextile. Now, Geotextiles can be many different types. I show you here three. First two are woven geotextile. This is called slit film geotextile. This is called multi-film geotextile. Both of them are woven. You can see the weaving pattern. And the third one is a non-woven geotextile. Uh, generally, woven geotextile have its higher tensile strength. And there are geotextiles, which are tubes, which are made of woven geotextile, non-woven geotextile, and composite geotextile. But it's very important to remember they need to have adequate tensile strength, and at least in the range of 60 to 120 kilonewton per meter. And as you see in this picture, this is a long tube, which is being manufactured in the production or many geotextile company where they produce it. They are sewn in the control environment. So you can really assure the quality of the seam. Then they are folded or rolled and then brought to the site. Okay, So these are not sewn in the field. Now, first use of geotextile for dewatering application happened almost 25 years. And it was by Paul Fowler and it was for municipal sewage sludge dewatering. And since then, there are thousands of projects all over the world where geotextile of different size have been used for agriculture, aquaculture, 
municipal paper industry and food industry and the list can go on and go on which is including fly ash dewatering and i am going to focus today's presentation on sediments which are dredged from ponds and lakes and rivers so let's take a few minutes and explain uh, a complex process of what happens when the slurries are pumped in the tube. So the filling happens, you have a slurry of ranging from 5% to 15% solid content. And this tube is permeable, okay? So slurry is pumped from the filling port and very quickly there are different interfaces which develop. Uh, clear water, particles and slurry which is still sedimenting and then filter cakes start process forming. And below that, you have filter cake, which is also being compressed. At the same time, the filtrate is coming out of the geotextile, mainly from the surface. And some of the filtrate which is coming out is coming through the filter cake, which will be much smaller rate than what kind of filtrate comes out from the tube surface area because geotextile is highly permeable. Its permeability can be equated to permeability of a gravel. So just to keep in mind. And, but once the filter cake is formed, the permeability of it reduces dramatically. And so this process is quite complex. Uh, people have made an effort to model all of this process. We have done that, but we realize it's quite complex process. And it doesn't happen in one time. Generally, geotextile tubes are filled four or five times. And in that process, the filtrate or water comes out, leaving the sediment, which has much smaller amount of water or higher solid content. Okay. We stopped. Um, Krishna, I need to stop sharing and come back again for a minute because. Okay, share. Let's see. Some problem. Let's see what's happening. Bear with me for a minute. I'm going to close this one. This happens also, I was just talking to Dr. Reddy, things can always go wrong and they do sometimes go wrong. Yeah, no, no okay. issue. Just see if, <laughs> yeah, it was going fine. So just uh, see if you can share the screen again. Yeah. I think don't, don't uh, worry about uh, all the interrupting, uh, you know, comments, sometimes, you know, those could, uh, you know. Okay. Yeah. Slide show. Okay. Yeah. Now let's start looking at the process. Different, there are geotextile dewatering is just one part of the process. And I'm going to just walk you through this slide. A uh, very important part of these project is the dredging. Dredging itself is a huge industry. I know very little about it, uh, but there's a dredging which sediments have to be dredged. Then before the sediment and slurries can go to the tube, there are process of looking based on the heterogeneity of the material and contaminants in the material. Uh, one has to pay attention and know what is going to be your material. An important part which I want to focus today is chemical conditioning. Now, once we know this information, these slurries will be pumped in the multiple tube. And in that, we will need to select what kind of geotextiles need to be selected, size and number of the tubes and how they're going to lay out and in what order we are going to dewater or pump them. And then we need to know what is rate at which the slurry is going to dewater. And after the dewatering process is completed, what is the percentage or retained sediment properties? And then we need to also need to know 
that whatever filtrate is coming out or effluent, what is the nature? What is the turbidity of that? If there are contaminants which is going to come out, how are we going to treat it? If there are extra effluent which is coming or and polymer which are coming out, are they toxic? And so those become very important part of a design. Now, uh, let's talk about a majority of you are geotechnical engineers, so you understand the sediment characteristics are very important. Uh, in 2007, Doug Gaffney gave a very interesting chart where he uh, kind of plotted variety of sediments which are removed from different or uh, dewatered, and dredge sediments are right here, okay, uh, where the cursor is. And the chart is in form of a cohesion, grain size, uh, particle size, and organics. And a couple of years ago, we have were fortunate to get around 20 different type of sediments from water bodies all over the country, mainly from Northeast. And we plotted this chart, again, in terms of uh, organic content, a plasticity index, and percentage fine. And you can see all these dots, they are all over the place. And the materials were dramatically different. And sometimes we were from SEM images, we find something we thought we made a major discovery, but these were chemical deposits. These were from uh, pharmaceutical companies. So who knows what these materials are? And, but they all were dewatering projects. I don't know why the slides are getting stuck or... Um, is this a very large file or what is happening? Maybe, maybe just the internet connection, uh, Shobha. Yeah, I think I'm yeah. also mm -hmm. sitting in. A... Yeah, that's the, that's the only thing. Yeah. We're used to uh, university internet connections and uh, home connections are not as good. Let me continue. Um, so um, hopefully this will um, come back to that. So. Uh, Sediment properties and often in projects, uh, we were very surprised that hardly any geotechnical properties are measured. Uh, no grain size, no plasticity, because slurries are so different. And I'll share with you when a case history that sometimes knowing the every property is not that important. Uh, so let me start again. Um, Okay. okay, let's go one more time. Okay, so I mentioned to you that chemical conditioning in the dewatering project is a very critical. But the question is, why do we need to add chemicals? And majority of the time, these chemicals are polymers, are polyacrylates. Uh, these are high molecular weight, long chains. And why we add them so that many of the fine particles which we have in slurries, we can flocculate them. Uh, and there are complex mechanism and uh, neutralization and uh, binding particle together. And there are polyacrylate, there are numerous type of polyacrylate, but we group them in cationic and anionic and non-anionic. And it is really an art uh, rather than science to select the right uh, polymer for flocculating a slurry. And what you see here in the middle of the picture is a flocculated fine silt and clay particles. And in after the flocculation, if the right polymer is selected, 
you can turn the very tiny, tiny particles of 10 microns, many of them, to a flock, which is one or two millimeter large. And what? Why is that important? Because our geotextile is highly permeable. Our woven geotextile has a very high tensile strength, but it's a very large pore opening. And so once we have a flock, which is a larger, then we can retain that on the geotextile. The flock also has tied all the fine particles together. And if this is a coarser, so the filter cake, which we are forming is also highly permeable. So there are two very important key uh, purpose here for flocculation or chemical conditioning, retaining all the fine particles and uh, so that all the filtrate coming out will be very clear. And you also have decreased the time of dewatering uh, for that purpose. I think I am having a problem uh, with the slide share. So let me not just use that without that, let's see. I think it's a very slow internet here. Okay. Krishna, any other way we can do that? Yeah, you can, you can just uh, put a, open the uh, PowerPoint and uh, not put it in the PowerPoint shows me that might help. Okay. Let's open the... Okay, can you see it, Krishna? Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right, sorry about that. This is a technology also have to be perfect. Uh, so in geotextile tube dewatering application, once we know the sediment, we know the polymer, then we need to know how it's going to perform. And when I say dewatering performance, there are three things we need to know about. Dewatering rate, at what rate the water is going to come out, final solid content in the tube after the dewatering and the quality of the filtrate, which is in terms of turbidity, concentration of the contamination, contaminant and the polymer, which we have added. But if there are extra, or extra polymer which might come out, then we need to know about that. What you see in the background are the geotextile tubing dewater and two of my former graduate students do, doing some testing in the field. There are some very simple tests to do more complex tests. Many of you know permeability tests, so they are more or less permeability tests, but except now you have a geotextile in the bottom of these, each of these device, and we put slurry on top of it. Some are with pressure, some are without pressure, and we can measure three things from these tests. One is what is the percentage solid after the dewatering is done, so which is the water content. We can measure how long does it take to dewater. And third, if we measure the filtrate, then we can measure the turbidity of the filtrate and we can measure contamination level in the in the. And this is a one of the tests, which is we call a hanging bag test, where you almost take five feet long um, bag and in which you uh, pour the flocculated slurry. And after the dewatering is done, you cut open and then measure the percentage solid. And that information is very important because that is the one which you need to design your tubes, which means how many tubes what diameter and in what way, in what sequence are you going to dewater them? Uh, this is a slide from one of the tests which we conducted at Syracuse University. Uh, it was partly funded from National Science Foundation. So we built a, a setup, huge setup uh, for the lab. It was huge, uh, almost two meter by two meter tube. And purpose of this test was not only to measure dewatering rate, which we did 
uh, but to measure whether we can add instead of polyacrylamide starch polymer, which are natural polymer, we also try to add fibers, synthetic fiber and natural fiber in the study to see whether that has effect on dewatering and most importantly, does it have any effect on sheer strength of sediments which are contained in the tube after the test. Now, uh, flocculent, which is coming come out of the geotextile tubes, generally we measure uh, using a technique which is really literally you take a kaolinite clay and make a slurry of a standard. And if the filtrate coming out of the tube has any polymer, then kaolinite will have flocculation. And from that, we indirectly measure what is the level of polymer which might be coming out of the tube. Uh, a few years ago, we use a streaming current detection method, and this is generally used for wastewater industry. And we found that that is more accurate than using the clay method. Now, recently we did some work because uh, polyacrylamide, particularly cationic polyacrylamide, is known to be toxic. Uh, so we uh, worked with a biologist. Uh, she has a big lab with the zebra uh, embryos or fish embryos. And what we tested is the effluent. One is a cationic polyacrylamide, other was cationic starch. And as you can see, the test data right here in the figure with the blue bars, uh, the effect of control, which had no polymer, uh, cationic starch and has absolutely very little effect on fish embryos health and whether they died or not, where a cationic polyacrylamide within the seven day exposure, all um, embryo completely died. So toxicity of the polymers, which is going to be coming out of effluent is important because amount of water which is going to come out where you're going to release it, whether you're going to treat it or not, is a very critical part of the project. Now, let me move to the case history. There are three dramatically different case history. One is a pond, which is a industrial pond. Uh, they form, make it blue. This is in Illinois. Uh, and you can see this pond, it looked like a chalky, muddy uh, material. It's very different. It is not a silt or clay. Special gravity is 1.36, and percentage solid in this pond is only 5 to 6% solid. Second is a Scudder Pond Retention Pond. This is in uh, New York, and around that is a residential community. And third is Anadaga Lake, which I started with, which is a very large lake uh, in the city of Syracuse. So let's take one case history at a time. So case history one, this is an industrial pond, settling pond, and company wanted to remove some of these slurries from the pond because they can continue to use this pond for settle, settling pond. And so we worked with the water waste, the water um, salt, uh, one company in Michigan, and uh, they wanted us to do variety of lab tests to predict dewatered solid content. So we perform three different type of tests. And then based on that, they did with the project. So this is what the paste looked like, or slurry looked like, looked like a milkshake actually. And after we put in the oven, uh, it has looked like a shrank, it has a lot of glue. And for polymer addition, the water salt tried many different cationic and anionic polymer and eventually they selected one anionic polymer. And if you closely look at this right-hand side of the flocks, the particles or slurry did get flocculate. So we con conducted three different type of tests in the lab. One is called pressure filtration test. Second is 2D dewatering test, which is two-dimensional where water can come out in radial direction from the geotextile and vertical direction. And it is under pressure. 
Insight is a very creative, one of my graduate students created a balloon where pressure is applied and it is applying a pressure on the study. And third is a standard centrifuge test, which we find is very effective way to predict percentage solid after dewatering. So this is what the filter cake looked like. We started with 6.3% solid concentration, very weak study. After dewatered, you can say it's around 20, 21% uh, solid content, which we can measure. And based on these two dewatering, de, uh, de we were able to develop a model which was given by Lawson, uh, but we found it very useful to predict using this simple model uh, from our 2D test, we can predict the performance of a different solid content and in three dimension. This is what happened after the company received the project. They used three tubes uh, and they dewater around 1,000 cubic yards. And this is what the solid content of the tube after dewatering looked like. It was around 25 to 30%. Remember, it started with 6%. And now after dewatering, after a month, it reached to 25 to 33%. And this was stiff enough or dry enough for them to take it to the landfill. And then they can use the retention pond. So what I just want to point out that some of the small scale lab tests, two dimensional tests and centrifuge tests, if you look at these numbers right here, except one dimensional pressure filtration tests can be very useful to predict dewatered solid content, which is very, very important part of many project in design. So let me move to the second case history. This is a retention pond uh, and around is a residential community. So before, and it is running out of a capacity. So they had to remove three feet uh, sediment from this pond. So before dredging could operate or can be done, uh, DEC conducted extensive sampling and they found that most of the sediments in the pond are non-contaminated. So which was very safe. And you can see here a parking lot. So this was a considered ideal place for geotextile tube to be placed. And in this project, they used five geotextile tubes of 86 to 100, 120 feet long. And cationic and anionic polyacromite were used. We were involved in this project with water salt and tenkate. Uh, because we wanted to try whether starch polyacromide, which is natural polymer, can that be effectively used to dewatering sediments such as from the scudder pond? So this is the nature of the sediment. I'm going to jump to next slide. And uh, we were fortunate to be able to go to the field site and perform what is called uh, these are basically a pressure filtration test. One is without excessive pressure, right here is called GDT, and another one is PGDT. And the result shows that both starch polymer and synthetic polymer gave almost same solid uh, retention in the pond or in the tube. We brought some of the sediment to the lab uh, not from the exactly from the dredge line, but they excavated sediment from the pond. And ex, uh, you can imagine these are highly variable sediments. And we set up a similar setup in our lab, and then we conducted the test, both uh, the pressure filtration test or GDG test and centrifuge test. Now, sediments are different, as you can imagine, from prawn born from uh, two different locations. And we divided into finer sediment and coarser sediment and perform all the tests with and without polymer. And we found that that centrifuge test, small scale test, uh, it can be very, very helpful in predicting the range of sediment which you need 
uh, to calculate number of tubes and time required the tubes for the full uh, application. Okay, and this is it. so sediment after dewatering. It was very interesting. They were clean sediments. They were giving to the all the neighborhood, and people have used those sediment for their garden. So nature of the sediment you start with dewatering end up in a very very different application. So let me take you to the one which is really long and very complex case history. Remember the Anadaga Lake, one of the most contaminated lake. And over 100 years, uh, like many lakes around the world, we have been dumping everything possible, including sewage and chemicals. And same is the case with Anadaga Lake. Uh, and as a cleanup project, which took around seven, 50, 60 years, uh, had very important part. They removed almost 2.2 cubic million contaminated sediment, and these were pumped in the tube. And I'm going to walk you through that. But all the contaminated sediment could not be removed. It was just not uh, financially feasible. So there are large amount of not as, I would say, hazardous sediments which are kept in the lake itself. Uh, since I moved to Syracuse uh, almost 35 years ago, I know that thousands of samples which have been taken from Anadaga Lake and water samples, uh, the really deep samples, shallow samples, and it took almost that much time to decide and identify which area has to be dredged and dewatered. Uh, all these options, which I mentioned right from the beginning, belt press, filter press, centrifuge were considered, including open drying, which is like sedimentation pond. And finally, geotextile tubes were selected uh, for dewatering and containing these sediments, which are highly contaminated sediment at the site. This project is a huge project. Uh, the sediments were dredged with a very fine and very computer operated dredges. Uh, and they were transported 6.4 kilometers away from the dredging site. And then there's a huge area I'm going to show you where the geotextile tubes, thousand geotextile tubes were used. Effluent was treated, every bit of the water came out of the tube, was treated and then discharged. And finally, all these geotextile tubes resulted in a landfill, means they built a landfill or cover on top of it. So let's just walk it through that. A geotextile were again, uh, high tensile, uh, tensile strength woven geotextile. Many of them were 90 meter long. 24 to 30, 27 feet per meter, and around 1,000 tubes were used. Hundreds of different polymers were considered uh, by doing PGD test and hanging bag test and pressure filtration test. And finally, this is a mystery. One polymer or one or two polymer were selected, which was added. There was a huge water treatment facility, which was built so that all the filtrate coming out of the sediment, uh, any contaminant coming out had to be removed, any polymer which might be coming out to be tested and removed uh, before it can be sent back to the lake. And finally, the, all the tube which I'm going to show you were capped and with multiple layer of soil and uh, flexible geomembrane. And at this point, if you go to the site, you see some very beautiful bushes and biodiverse areas. And as you can see that there's a huge consolidation area. This is a water treatment area. These are sediment processes area. And the pipeline is coming far away from the lake to these uh, uh, tubes. And, and you can imagine thousand tubes, not all of them in one layer. There were five different layers, as you can see these white layers. Uh, and they are filled in sequence. Uh, and um, 
few textile header system were modified. So there is a uniform uh, filling of the tubes around the whole area. And although settlements was not issue because site was pretty good, operators were able to change the flow with the simple and stability of these tubes were analyzed. And you can find the papers on that. Uh, because I live in the community, there were issues uh, which were public were uh, complaining about odor problem. And I am not sure it's a really an odor problem, but white color which you see on top of the geotextile tube, which is generally black because of and are the paint. The tubes were painted with the white paint. Uh, just an idea of decreasing the odor. I'm not sure that happened, but black tube turned into white tube. Uh, so I'm not sure this is going to work, but uh, because I'm not in PowerPoint mode, but you can find some very interesting YouTubes, not just from DEC and uh, about Onondaga Lake, but if you go to the website of some of the geotextile tube manufacturers, you can find some interesting YouTubes about operation and how the dredging is done and how the geotextile tubes are placed in the containment. Lot of very, very good information. And uh, this is my last but one slide. And this is the aerial view of the geotextile, thousand geotextile tubes in which highly contaminated sediment is stored. And now it is a landfill. It is a land which is owned by Honeywell. This is their property. Uh, there's a road, which I think majority of people living in this area don't know. Uh, these are the, because it looks like a green area. So this is a very large project. And I like this to just think about 1.9 million work hours were spent on this project. And there are, I think, hundreds of engineers, literally, who worked on this project. So this is one of the very large projects of uh, solving and cleaning Anadaga Lake. And at this point in Anadaga Lake, people can go fishing, people can go swimming, uh, which was banned almost 50 years ago. So what lessons did we learn or did I learn working in this particular area for last uh, 15 or so years? I truly believe the geotextile tube is a very viable technology. Uh, for a small project to a large project. I also believe, not just because I developed with my students lots of different tests and model, that some simple tests, centrifuge and two-dimensional flow tests, can really help uh, to predict and estimate dewatering and try different things, different polymer, different fiber. We have done lots of different things. And even simple model, and I'm not talking about complex 3D model, can help designer. And most importantly, I, I'm very, very happy that as a part of my National Science Foundation project, I had an element of collaboration with industry. And it gave me a very different perspective of what should be the focus. Because my focus with my students have been, I want to come up with solution which can be applied. And we did come up some great idea and the partnership has been fantastic. So just a few minutes on acknowledgement. I like to acknowledge National Science Foundation for supporting my research for many, many years. Uh, companies like WaterSolve and Greg, and they have become a real great, great friends. Uh, Tenkate, Husker, SNF, these people have come to our labs, donated equipment, George and Anthony showed us how the polymers are mixed, spent two, three days with us. And most importantly, uh, some of my visitors from Turkey and my colleague, Andrew, Angel Falamino, and most importantly, my students. And you can see some of them standing next to a geotextile tube. Uh, with every student, I learned a lot. And uh, especially to all the students who are attending uh, this webinar. Uh, you are very, very important uh, part of this profession. 
I started as a geotechnical and earthquake and soil dynamics. Today, I'm doing polymers and working with biologists and chemists and learning constantly. Your project in future will be all multidisciplinary, okay? So if you get a chance to take course in biology or strengthen your chemistry, please do that because um, I focus mostly on uh, physics and other matter. So I have time now to answer questions and 